Welcome to We Are Not Wizards. We are the best, but not wizards. Enjoy the show. <laughs> of We Are Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host into April and it's April showers and it's raining constantly. You could say it's raining potentially cats and dogs and um, I'm fine with like it being raining because obviously it, 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 it helps the plants grow but at the moment I must admit I feel like I'm kind of trapped in a cave. I can't go out, I can't cut the grass, I can't do the gardening. You could always say I'm looking for something to kind of get me out of this kind of whole rainy, cloudy situation. I need some kind of Stone Age distraction, you know, before I end up having a hissy fit with all the rain that we're having. So in order to help me not have a hissy fit or maybe do have a hissy fit, I have got Chris Stone from Stone Age Distractions. And he's here for a chat. He's not here, for he's a not chat. here, you know, he's just here for a chat. We're going to have a gentle, a gentle, gent- a gentle, gentle conversation. <laughs> <You know. laughs> and and um, I'm here to try and help for- you avoid hissy fits. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to, I mean, we're going to, we're going to talk about this because we're coming from the, the kind of the, the Venn diagrams of pets where we'd actually have two separate circles. Cause you're very, very much got, I can see there's a cat on a chair behind you whereas i have a dog on the floor and i'm pretty sure there's a game in that the cat in the chair the dog <laughs> on the floor it's probably Definitely. a kid's book there's probably a kid's book there's probably a kid's book out there's probably dr a kid's seuss book did that didn't he um <laughs> <laughs> he's probably yeah he needed a hat you never hear very much from him anymore no it's true i think dog see in scotland it would be cat in the chair and dog on the flare which Scots <laughs> obviously kind of rhymes, you see. Perfect. So you could continue a kind of a whole kind of a kind of yeah a kind of a whole kind of a kind of poetry poetry kind of situation. Um, what we like to do, and we're we're not wizards, is we like to have we're going to start to do the whole journey. So we like to have a, a look back at the kitten of the past before we have a look at the scratching post of the present <laughs> and the uh, fur balls <laughs> of the future. <laughs> <laughs> I my my first question is right is is the whole cat being a cat person thing is that part of the overall kind of marketing plan and game design I mean what came first was it the was it the mechanics and the design for the game or was it the fact that look I love cats if I'm going to make a game it's got to be about cats basically um good question I uh, it, the game was definitely theme first. So I mm. remember the moment when I was sitting at my kid's soccer game. And since I'm not really a sports ball kind of guy, I usually have a notebook at these things. And so I'm constantly mm. jotting down uh, ideas and whatnot. And the, the idea came to me because I had taken my cat to the vet that morning that there's got to be a game in this, right? <laughs> this is what game designers always say after virtually any experience, there's got to be a game in this somewhere. So yeah. I made some notes um, about a game of trying to get your cat in the carrier to take to the vet. And I thought that might have some legs um, and tried to develop it for a, a, a brief time on my own. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did you like that? Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> it might have legs. I, yeah, uh, I, just, I just imagined a game. I'm just wondering why the game box doesn't actually have leg, actually like cat legs, have legs on it. No, I I like it. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like uh, Kramer's the coffee table book that turns into a coffee table <laughs> in Seinfeld. Or there, isn't there the whole kind of bears, there's the whole bears versus babies as well by um, yes. the exploding kitten people, which yep, is literally has like a, a furry. Big Fur, furry like box. a big furry box <laughs> yes, like a furry absolutely. box what I'm thinking as a quick aside I'm thinking that in the next version of the game you quite literally have 
four holes in the bottom of the box and they have like four kind of finger gloves <laughs> with cat legs in them. And you can put, I like where your you head's at, your Richard. Hand, <laughs> you can put your hand And walk in the, box. the game box around the table. And you can going, walk meow. the game box around the table. And that's an entire new mechanic. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm gifting you stuff, it. Mr. Stone. No, that's great. I'm I'll have to list you stuff. in the credits uh, when we, when we definitely steal <laughs> that idea. <laughs> I'll have to list you in the credits and then make sure that, like, I block you across all, all yeah, kinds yeah, of different exactly. social medias to make sure that we don't, you know. Because let's face it, when we're talking in the green room, I literally ruined April Fool's Day for you. Uh, so you did. <laughs> you had such a great idea for what we should have done on April Fool's Day. For what you should have done, yeah. I mean, um, I don't usually have kind of um, my guests kind of, I guess, regretting their life choices. But mm-hmm. I think if we're going to kind of continue down this line, we might as well kind of go, go through the whole hog. I have yet to make somebody cry. Um, let's see if we can. Let's see if we can. Fair enough. Let's see if we can. Do. Life goals. Let's see if we can do. Yeah. So, are we going to share? Um, are we going to share the April Fool's idea, or just leave people wondering? I, 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 I don't know if these people deserve to hear the April Fool's idea because I don't want them think. I think, yeah, we basically decided, right? Mm-hmm. Then I will get around. Hissy fit is literally about taking your cat to the vet, which, as we know, has its own challenges. And I said, but about a, what about if you took your dog to the vet? To which Chris said, well, that would be an easy thing. You could just open up the, the door to the car. The dog would jump straight in. To right. which I said, that should have been a print and play version on April 1st. Here's our first expansion <laughs> to Hissy Fit. And it was just one card that people... The one the card game. The dog, <laughs> the dog Barky gets fit. in the car. <laughs> <laughs> just, and then you could also have... You could have like... You could literally have like 20 versions of the same card, but it's just different breeds. Because if there's one thing about dog owners, part of them is just like, well, that's a Labrador. I'm not interested. Where's the where's the Spaniel or right. where's the Cockapoo or where's the Doberman or where's the, you know, where's the American, the American uh, bully dog? I mean, where, where are they? It's a 60, it's a 60 card game and all the cards are the same <laughs> except just... for the breed of the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Play this you know card, I, the dog would, gets in the car. People would buy it. <laughs> people would buy I, that. It's possible. If you, people you know, are crazy that, about their and pets. That would, act, that would fit into the whole kind of getting the box with the holes in it and then the glove thing because you could just do the, <laughs> the dog kind of walking about. I'm into it. This is where I'm we are. into it. Expansion. That's, I mean, you're, you're just pure gold this is what you're hearing at the moment people absolutely pure gold you better be <laughs> sitting down and taking notes because this was the moment where stone age distractions went from being kind of like stratospheric this is this is where we're exploding kittens exploding who exploding in fear that's what they're going to be that's what i'm going to be saying um, <laughs> your royalty check is in the mail richard it's definitely uh, yeah exactly in a digital cash society here's <laughs> your check <laughs> Yeah, here's your paper check. <laughs> Signed with wet ink. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck finding a bank to cash this yeah. bad boy. That's all we'll see. Um, so, gr- okay, grow, gr- growing up, what were you? Because the thing I noticed there's there's two sides to, to to board game designers I usually hear about. One of them was I was very very creative. All I did all day was like draw stuff, create stuff. And then when I fell into board games, it got the creative juices flowing and it pushed me into designing the game. Or the other side was I was a very theoretical, mathematical kind Mm -hmm. of kid. I liked a lot of logic stuff and I ended up getting into things like chess and backgammon. And then when board games came along, I slid into the Euro stuff and then from there... I ended up kind of, you know, I wanted to design a game because I love the kind of the math stuff and the logic right, stuff right. kind of behind it. So for yourself, where would you say you were kind of fitting on that slippery, <laughs> slippery side? On that continuum, <laughs> yes. I was definitely on the creative side. So I came mm-hmm. into games through role-playing games uh, back in the mm-hmm. 70s, 
in uh, Dungeons wow. and Dragons as a teenager, you mm. know, um, and uh, did that all sort of into college, um, but then really kind of didn't play games for a long time, for many, many years until more recently around like 2014 or so. Um, and I mean, I had played board games growing up, uh, but not... Yeah. Uh, not a lot. I mean, we we actually were pretty lucky to have some pretty cool board games. Like I remember the original Dark Tower board game was something my brother and I yeah. would play, um, which was awesome. Wow. Um, but other than that, it was the, your standard fare uh, board games. But around, like I say, 2014, 2015, my brother actually sent a copy of Pandemic to my kids at the time as a Christmas <laughs> present or something. <clears throat> they they couldn't have been or any a, less interested. Or a subtle threat. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they were not the least bit interested. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> but um, they they had no interest in it. But I was um, was um, uh, dating a woman at that time, and and so I took it the next time I went to see her and said, "Hey, this looks kind of cool. Let's give it a try." And we both yeah. really loved it, and so we became huge pandemic fans and sort of got all the expansions and and that was that was me down the rabbit hole of of hobby board games um and then a couple of years later started thinking well this could be an interesting way well actually what happened was i went from being in a creative career to being in a more Mm. sort of administrative career and was looking um, maybe not consciously but was looking for more of a creative outlet and having Mm. gotten involved in uh, board games I started thinking about designing board games and and so um, went heavily into des- developing a really a way too big <laughs> for my first board game design <laughs> as I think is common um, I think, and I think everybody I think everybody does that I think they can I think they're like um, I think restraint is a good thing and I've spoken about this before is if I give somebody mm-hmm. 150 cards and 50 meeples and say right you knock yourself out you do whatever i'll come back to them in six months and if there's a likelihood they've not done anything but if i give right. them a deck of like 25 cards and five meeples and say right go away and come back to me with a game you you go yep. back to them two three days later and they've already managed to kind of work something out so i think restraint absolutely is a, is a kind of a, a good thing was the yep. was the big game? Was that like some kind of adventure type dungeon crawler type game that you were thinking about? It was yeah, and it's a game I'm still interested in developing uh, at some point mm-hmm. now that I have a little more design experience because I do think it would be a great game. Um, the name mm-hmm. of this game was the Clockwork Maze of Professor Blunderbuss, and it was a <laughs> <laughs> it was a sort of steampunk themed uh, yeah. game with. Um, tiles out on a board but the tiles Mm -hmm. were all sort of gear shaped and all interlocked and rotated um but they didn't they didn't actually um rotate each other the way gears really do um Mm. they they sort of moved independently of each other and you were nav trying to navigate this maze uh and sort of a dudes on a map kind of uh way but um it had some magnetic parts involved and it was really it was really a lot, <laughs> but I think it's, I still think it's got a lot of potential and I'm now, I've actually been working with a, a, a board game designer who's also an engineer um, who um, he's actually helping me come up with a way to make the, the gears, actual gears that actually interlock and turn each other and um, do some cool stuff. So I think that's got potential yeah. for a lot of table presence if I can work out all the details of that. That'd be really cool. The the one I think the one thing that I've seen where they use magnets to spin a board round was I think Coloma. Mm, where okay. there's a cent <clears throat> one of the central points is like a circular disc. So the magnets contain within the disc. So it's a very, very small magnet on both sides. And you basically okay. you rotate the disc depending on the round and that decides kind of what that decides kind of what resources and stuff like that are available and it kind of works. It kind of like it kind of works really, really. It kind of works really, really well. Yeah, um, that's fantastic. Uh, I love that, magnets in any game. <laughs> <laughs> is it not? Is that not a? Is that not a bit of a health and safety risk if you have too many kind of magnets kind of going on? 
I think it definitely increases your cost for safety testing, and it uh, probably raises the age, the age range <laughs> that you're able to market to for sure. Exactly, because like, you don't want the I kids swallowing the magnets. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say it's like one of these things. If you don't want to, if you don't want, if you don't want to make a game for kids, but you don't want to say you're making a game for kids for young kids. Fill that thing with magnets. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> and then you'll literally, by law, you'll need to put it from you. You'll need to get... It's like, how old do you need to play? It's got magnets in it. So how long do you... How old do you need? You need to be 21, basically. <laughs> right. It's like, it's, it's either this or get a license to kind of like drive a truck. <laughs> right. Basically, it's got so many... It's got so many kind of... So many kind of magnets on it. So is it... Is it something that you're kind of dipping into now and again? Is it kind of like, have you got kind of like the folder and you just open up the box of stuff and you just open it up and go back to it and just tinker away and then kind of leave it alone yeah. again? Is that how it kind of works? I mean, I'm always thinking about design um, and I always mm. have a few kind of irons in the fire. Um I, my folder is very full <laughs> of uh, designs that I've started and taken to different levels of completion and either shelved mm -hmm. or sort of kept kept in the running. I've probably got 20 or 25 different design uh, game design folders wow. in my in my pending uh, folder on my computer desktop that you know are things that I want to go back to someday. Um, but yeah, I've got a lot of stuff. Uh, I tend to prioritize things based on um market interest i guess like i you know i'm pitching yeah. to publishers you know we ran the kickstarter for hissy fit um because my co-designer and i uh, levi robertson um who's a fantastic designer in his own right he and i have really enjoyed working together on hissy fit uh we both got frustrated you know trying to pitch to publishers just because that is a really daunting process and um yeah it doesn't feel like um and don't i don't want to anyone to take this the wrong way i i really respect publishers and their process for picking games but at, at some level they're so inundated with uh pitches i have to believe that it's not just about the merit of the game <laughs> you know in other words i'm sure there are a ton of fantastic games that aren't getting picked up by publishers um and i just yeah. feel like uh, a lot of what goes into that is uh having the right relationships and um, having a lot of luck play into it. And of course you have to be well positioned with a fantastic game in order for luck to strike. Uh, but it just felt like uh, getting it in front of the right people to make the decision to, to sort of rise above the noise was super challenging. And so we just decided, Hey, we want to be published game designers. Let's, let's dive into the self-publishing path and get something out into the marketplace so people can see it and hopefully like it and talk about the fact that you know we're doing good work and hopefully that'll help us uh in our other efforts to get published and so uh that was the route we chose but yeah to back to your original question sort of the reason that i pick one game over another to, to favor at any given moment is uh, often which ones have piqued the interest of potential publishing partners so, and I have a few things in that bucket right now. Do you do you play a lot of games on a regular basis? Do you have like a regular game night, and are you able to sample kind of what what is out and what's what's the hotnesses and the new releases mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question and a super important uh, facet of design. I think now I know there are designers. <laughs> Uh, who I've talked to who have been like, oh, I try not to play too many games because I don't want my mind getting like filled with other people's ideas and I want to come at the design mm. process fresh. I'm the opposite. Like I, and I, and I, I feel like I really need a lot of insight into just like you said, you know, what's the hotness? What are people interested in? What, what kind of design sensibilities are, you know, appeal to gamers. And so for a, uh, because, like I said, I've only been sort of delving into modern hobby games uh, since 2015, 20, 
16 and back in that realm i had missed a lot of the sort of golden age of a lot of the big euros that came out um and a lot of the really classic designers so i have been trying to play catch up (laughs) playing as many games as i can just to (laughs) expand my knowledge of the portfolio of what's out there and it's hard (laughs) um i don't but i don't know if you can i don't know if you can though i think i think we're all in a it's a it's um I think because the board game kind of physical world, I think we're trying to address it now with like board game arena. And I think yes, places like board I game agree. arena do a really, they do a really, really good job of yep, allowing yep. people who don't have the capital to be able to go and experience a kind of an, an, an awful lot of games. But if somebody says to me, look, I am not in, you know, I'm not keeping up with the hotness. I don't have every single new game that's coming out. I'm kind of like, well, yeah, that's, that's that's absolutely acceptable. If somebody right. said to me, "Oh, I'm getting every single new game that's coming out. I've just like backed this game, this game, and this game," I'm like saying, um, "Do you want? Do you need an intervention? Do you need somebody to sit down and go through your kind of your, kind of your finances? Because that is right. a, it's a scary thing to kind of to kind of keep up with everything. But at the same time, when you're saying you're kind of keeping an eye on what's hot and what's out there. If you see a lot of games in a particular genre or particular mechanic and you see them all coming out, does that ever force you, does that ever make you kind of go, well, maybe we need to kind of take this off the list or maybe, you know, that this thing that I was on the fence about, maybe let's not proceed with that because it doesn't seem to have an awful lot of legs, basically. Right. Yeah, I don't think I'm quite as concerned about what the market is doing in this moment because mm. to your point it, it there's had there's been a lot of lead time <laughs> of those designs yeah. ha, you know that have taken a lot of time to get to market and so if you're seeing the trend you've probably already missed the trend um yeah. and so if i see a bunch of mushroom games on the market um and i try to make a mushroom <laughs> game now it's going to be a year or two and you know by yeah. then there's probably too many mushroom games or whatever you you know whatever example you want to use no you know for me no, let's for face me, it we're, we're talking we're talking kind of deep impact armageddon aren't we i mean let's face it we're talking about that kind of level undergrove and, let's name them undergrove and mycelium you know they kind of came out around about the same time and it's i'm true. wondering if it's there true. is gonna, if there is going to be like an armageddon kind of deep impact kind of comparison it's like yeah, they've got big asteroids. They've got big mushrooms, kind of smashing into places and wrecking them. <laughs> right. But at the same time, one of them seems to have an actual story based on scientific fact, and the other one, <laughs> and the other one has decided <laughs> that they're well, going to. And this is a famous anecdote: is another one deciding they were going to teach a bunch of drillers how to become right. astronauts, <laughs> as opposed to teaching. <laughs> I don't know if you had a bunch of astronauts to become. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Was it Ben Affleck or something? Just like turned around to Michael Bay or something and said, "Like, (laughs) would it not be? um, (laughs) Would it not be easier to have like MIT educated astronauts teaching (laughs) them how to drill as opposed to teaching like kind of oil boys how to kind of like become astronauts?" And it's like it's a different field. (laughs) Apparently, no, no, Richard. <laughs> you, <laughs> you do not to, look behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> I am the great and powerful Michael Bay. Uh, yes, this is before, is it? It was Bay, wasn't it? I'm pretty sure it was Michael Bay that did Armageddon. Listen to this Aerosmith song and forget about the plot holes. <laughs> <laughs> here's here's Liv Tyler. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> here's Liv Tyler. Uh, like, okay, okay, Michael. Well, what I all I know now from from that story is that I really need to see a movie or play a game about a giant mushroom crashing into the earth. I think we've got I something see there. That. Right. It's called uh, Sport Impact, <laughs> um, and it is literally a. Well, it's a kind of a. Can you? Okay, let's design this. Okay. So you get to decide your mushroom and you've got two points to your mushroom before it impacts into earth, okay? You've got to, you've got, it's like a, it's like a, it's a tableau building game. You've got a certain amount of spaces. You The board is actually a mushroom and it's got like about, say, 15 spaces to hit kind of like half size cards. And you've got a chance to either balance <laughs> up either 
the damage that the mushroom is going to incur as it breaks through the Earth's atmosphere and hits the ground to the effects that it has when it hits the Earth's surface. So you've got to basically balance up whether or not how much how much damage the mushroom is going to incur. And if you get damage to your mushroom on impact, then it removes some of the cards. However, mm. it also creates kind of like the first wave of damage, which you're damaging a larger area if you're at, if your kind of mushroom hits the air. If it hits the earth at a higher speed and a higher impact, yes, it damages the mushroom, but you do more damage. But on the other side, if you do less damage and more of your mushroom survives, you've got the ability to basically have different engineered spores that are going to take long-term damage. And it's over, like, say, about 15 rounds. So you've got the first five, which is to do with the with the preparation. The next five, which is to do with the impact and the immediate effects of the impact. And the following five, which is to do with the aftermath and what happens. Maybe you spread more mushrooms to encourage other mushrooms to attack. That's mushroom impact. That's coming to Kickstarter. <laughs> Quarter one. I, I like everything about that, but now we need to add push your luck. And a dexterity element. I think we're there. I think that's perfect. You could have a little wooden mushroom Mm -hmm. and you have like a circular board, like a target board. And it's almost like the Scottish sport of curling (laughs) where you've got to Ah, flick your mushroom and depending on where it hits... That's like you know it. okay. I think let's we're on to right. something. Okay, here. so that sh- all right. I'll send the paperwork. <laughs> I do this all the time. I'll send the paperwork. <laughs> I think I'll be sending you the paperwork, Mister Stone. Actually, I mean, you're just <laughs> no, listening that's, in. That's fair. That's, that's we're going to start with. Was, we'll start. We'll start with an NDA. <laughs> I thought you were looking for a publisher. I was going to send you a license agreement. <laughs> oh well, I mean, let's. I mean, you are officially one up on me because you are a publisher of a game. I, technically, I am. I, uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's yeah, true. true. Technically, I am. Um, Technically, I am kind of not. Um, <laughs> how quickly was it getting hissy fit from an idea on a piece of paper to actually having it kind of down and having it kind of playing and having it kind of going? That's a great question. So I'm pulling up my folder right now because I can tell you exactly you when... I love this. Uh, when the concept, when I create, when I was sitting at my son's game and when I made the initial sketch, and that was on May 19th of 2020. So it, it has taken wow, almost was... four years to go from my first sketch in a wow. notebook to today <clears throat> uh, to really, well, yeah, just under four years to deliver to to our backers, which I, I don't think is atypical. I think that's probably not not too unusual. It also sat for a while before I, you know, reached out to Levi, and really that's when we started designing in earnest. Um, and we went through a lot of different designs for this theme. And like I said, we started, we really did start with the theme of the game and mm-hmm. tried to find a lot of different, or tried a lot of mechanics in order to find something that would sort of recreate the feel of wrestling with a cat who was not happy uh, trying to get it into a into a carrier to take to the vet. You know, we tried a lot of different... We tried uh, sort of like, uh, almost like a tactical, uh, you know, you build a... You'd have, and originally it was going to be a mint tin game. We were originally going to have like cards that laid out on the table to form sort of a map of the house. And you had a meeple of the cat that you were ch- using cards to manipulate, to move around physically yeah. trying to get it, you know, tactically into the carrier space. Um, that didn't really work. But um, yeah, we, we went down a lot of roads before we, we settled on the current mechanism, which I think does a really good job of uh, giving you the feels. <laughs> I thought for a second there you were going to say we had the mint tin game and the mint tin was going to have claws on the side. And then what you did is during the middle of the game, you picked up the mint tin and you threw it at the other player. The game can be frustrating, but I don't think anyone's actually ever picked up the box and hurled it at their their fellow players. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, you can get, I mean, there's there's bound to be one or two people who have like, like you hear about these table flip folk all the yep. time. I mean, if you get a heavy, heavy Euro box, I mean, I've got <laughs> Mythic battle, Mythic Battles and the Heroes of Land, Air and Sea boxes. Ah, yes. I mean, if you, 
I mean, if somebody threw that at you, I mean, you're not you're not getting up <laughs> <laughs> anytime, anytime, kind of, anytime, kind of soon. Um, it, was there a big change between the first iteration? Once you had been working with Levi, was there a big change between the first iteration down to the final iteration that ended up in Kickstarter? And was yeah, there a absolutely. lot of stuff that you left out, basically? Well, um, there was a lot of stuff that we left out in the sense that we just completely shifted gears several times and completely changed mm -hmm. the, the mechanisms that the game is built on, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't think we left value on the table like i feel like what we came up with was a hundred percent the right experience that people will want from a game like this you know we found the right balance of weight i think and complexity i mean it's a game that families can play together even with little kids you know it's marked eight eight plus is the age that we've done safety testing for and mm -hmm. all that but you know i had yeah i've had people with six-year-old kids who they're able to play as a family and enjoy the game together. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I think that the development process of the game took the correct path and everything that was supposed to end up in the game made it into the game, including a lot of fun mm -hmm. stuff that, you know, um, in terms of thematic stuff like illustration, like we, we ended up working with a fantastic illustrator on this game who really captured the spirit of, of, uh, of what we were trying to do as well. And so I think she brought a lot to the project that we couldn't have imagined without her. So that's been really fun. I just, I absolutely love the fact that normally when people are talking about kind of like cat games and stuff, you can see them going, oh, look at his little face and look at his little bow tie. <laughs> and it's like, I'm looking at the pictures and illustrations of these cats and it's just one bit of malevolence after another. <laughs> there, does, <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any kind of cat illustrated at all, which doesn't have the kind of, if you look at the wrong way at me, I'm going to literally, <laughs> you know, you're going to need stitches. Right. Like the kind of the local hospital, <laughs> which is a nice change because I mean, if I see another cutesy cat, I mean, I'm not right. obviously with the, the dog lying there. If I see another right, cutesy right. cat, I'm just be like, I don't need another cutesy cat. But the fact you've got like cats that are kind of like, they're a bit annoyed, they're a bit angry, they're a bit kind of mischievous looking, they're a bit perturbed. I ca I'm I'm here for that. I'm here for let yeah, yeah. let cats be annoyed. That's what I'm kind of. <laughs> that's what I'm kind of. That's what I'm kind of kind of saying here. Um, we've got. I mean, <clears throat> and one one of the reasons you're you're here is because I just like to speak to people kind of like post campaign because mm -hmm. I think once once you've delivered it, you know, you can be a bit more introspective and you've not got your kind of mm -hmm. you've not gonna kind of please have a look at our campaign kind of right. <laughs> so based on that, um. What was it, being a kind of a first-time kind of publisher, mm -hmm. what was it like kind of creating noise and, and getting people kind of interested in the game? Um, was was there some facts that any of that like, took you by surprise or you found easier or harder than you kind of expected it to be? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question that every, I think <laughs> it's a big question that a lot of people who have not run a successful Kickstarter ask themselves in earnest all the time and designers, this mm -hmm. is what designers who are contemplating becoming publishers bang their head on the table, you know, trying to figure out. And it's, um, to be honest, it's not what I'm best at. This is where I was so, um, honored and privileged to be partnered with Levi, who I felt like yeah. was much better at the, uh, at the marketing and community building than I, than I was. And I think had a little more bandwidth at the time to to focus on that. Um, some of the things we did. Uh, so I had been building a mailing list since the times that I was first bringing my first game to playtest events and collecting people's yeah. emails. And so I had an I had an email list with you know maybe a hundred people on it, something like that. Yeah. Um, and so we used that as a base. But Levi, we created a Facebook group 
um, rather than a page, which is an important distinction because a Facebook page is sort of a place where a company can communicate out to their fans, but the yeah. fans can't really can't really interact that much with a with a page. You know, um, a group is somewhere where you can really start conversations, and anyone can start the conversation. You know, the members can start yeah. the conversation um, and ask us questions and show pictures and stuff like that. So that created a really valuable forum where we could do some fun community building activities. And this is where Levi was sort of the king of this project. So uh, part of our uh, community building had to do with um, getting our backers into the game. And so a big part of our campaign was we've got an illustrator, we've created about a third of the art And we actually launched our campaign with only a third of the art complete. And what that allowed us to do was to say, we got a lot of slots to fill here, people, you know, yeah, um, yeah, you can yeah. you can participate and we want your cats in our game. And so not only wow. did we have a backer level that allowed you to pay, you know, substantially more money than the cost of the game to get your cat, you know, to sort of buy your cat into the game. But we also had a bunch of contests and stuff on the Facebook group where, you know, we had bracketed voting uh, contests where, you know, you'd bring your friends into the group and now everybody's voting in brackets on people who submitted pictures of their cats, you know, whose cat uh, should be on this card, you know? And so, um, that just got fever pitch kind of engagement of people just going nuts, wanting, you know, bringing all their friends into the group and getting people to vote on their cats. And um, it was, it was fantastic. We had sort of like uh, guess the jelly bean, how many jelly beans in the jar kind of contests. We had just straight up drawings where if you joined the mailing list, we were going to draw from the mailing list to give out free copies of the game. We gave away free prototypes and, merchandise and probably a bunch of stuff that we shouldn't have done in terms of like going overboard but but all that created a lot of buzz for the game um and i've seen it before i think um frank west uh, um when he did isle of cats Mm -hmm. he did quite a simple thing which was kind of like he did the thing like just post his pictures of your cats and obviously i you know i've known frank for years which meant i took the opportunity to post pictures of my dog Sure. Whenever I could, and just say, you know, just say, you know, um, dogs are better. <laughs> photo, um, photo bomb. Because <laughs> pretty much going to do that. But then one of the, but it was about kind of building the community. It was kind of like making it fun, and it took a kind of a way the kind of thing which was, let's face it, in all honesty, I'm asking you for money for a product, but if we kind of all make it fun and we turn it into more of a community, then it means people kind of get a bit more kind of emotionally invested. And this is true with kind of like Isle of Cats. If you look at the group now, mm-hmm. they, he, he ran a kind of a, he's got two cats. So he claims, um, I just think it's marketing. Frank, I've still said, even though you've provided pictorial proof, but he started to get people putting the <laughs> pictures of their cats in the board game box when they were doing unboxing, when they were playing the game for the first time, he had pictures the box was big enough for them to have their cat kind of sitting in the box so it almost became like oh, yeah. yeah i got it almost became when fulfillment which sometimes can be a bit of a let's face it can be a, a bit of a challenge and can be a bit of the time where it can get people's kind of heckles up um mm-hmm. hackles heckles heck hackles whatever <laughs> um i think it's hackles if it's a cat well, once well. they get their hackles up they start heckling you i think <laughs> i think that's that's that i'll take that that's a good thing um but it became a kind of a fun thing because as people were getting their kind of were getting their games they were putting pictures on the group of this is my cat in the lid and it almost and in fact i think in the inside of the box it actually says mm-hmm. this is a space for you to put your cat so yeah, they've got the, you know, they've got sort actually... of a target. It's got circles with a thing <laughs> yeah. that says this is this is the cat storage spot. This is the in fact. Yeah, this is the yeah. <laughs> one of our cards in Hissy Fit pays a little tribute to that. So we actually so the the backer photos or sorry the the cats that are in the game that came from our backers, um, yeah. they they prov- provided us with a photo and then our artist worked off the photo to create the pictures yeah. and the one of our backers. Um, who was a fantastic supporter of ours throughout the whole process. Uh, a gal named Mary has a cat 
whose name is Commander Saul Tai. I don't know if you're a Battlestar Galactica fan. But, <gasps> oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Commander, yeah. Uh, Commander Saul Tai was the guy with the eye patch, you know, the, the yeah. grizzled commander with the eye patch. Her cat is a one-eyed, sphinx, hairless <laughs> sphinx cat. And <laughs> she, <laughs> she sent us a picture. So he's bald with one eye, wow. and he just looks like, uh, you know, a t- <laughs> tough guy. She sent us a picture of, of the commander uh, in the lid of the Isle of Cats box, ah, sitting right. in his proper okay. spot. So we yeah. used that photo, and so one of our cards actually has a cat in, and uh, I, we didn't we didn't call it Isle of Cats. I think it says Island Cats on the side of the box, but uh, we didn't well, want to didn't want to risk any copyright infringement. But uh, well, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You don't have to all of a sudden withdraw like kind of like thousand copies right. of the game just because you right. accidentally thought, oh, this is fun, and they're like. Oh, you think it's fun, do you? <laughs> Let's yeah, see do what you your indeed. lawyers. Let's see what your lawyers can <laughs> yeah. say. Exactly. Um, so anyway, but the, that was a, a fun homage, I thought, to uh, to another great cat game. So, but one of the things you also did, and I think you should were getting around to this, was get a game and adopt a cat. Yep that that's right. Which, which I thought was unusual because um, I think. I can imagine Simon doing something like get a game and trying to adopt a zombie and them sending a a brain-eating flesh eater around to your house and then saying, you know, we'll reimburse you up to $200 in in adoption fees, which I mean, I don't even know if that zombie adoption is a kind of an industry. But obviously it's a very kind of... It's a noble, it might be well known in California, but you guys in California (laughs) just do your own thing as it is. Um, But what made you decide to kind of go ahead and kind of do, do that then? Yeah. So this was my favorite part of the campaign uh, for a couple of reasons. And the original idea uh, came from a podcast uh, that I heard. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Gabe Barrett's show, the uh, board game design lab. Uh, podcast yep. which um, I've gotten so much out of that one um, over the years and his Facebook group as well but um, uh, one of the interviews I heard on there was um, from I think it was the Exploding Kittens folks talking about the um, the hand-to-hand wombat campaign uh, I don't know if you followed that at all, but and I hope I'm getting all the facts right here, the publisher name and the game name and all of that. But they, the, the, there was a campaign where they gave away a house as one of the reward ple- uh, levels. So, and, and what they would do is they would constantly over the course of the campaign go in and just keep adding these bizarre pledge levels uh, like like that and you know if you bought the game it it didn't cost any more than the game you just buy the game but you use that pledge level in the kickstarter and you get a house and it was a real house it was like a tiny house or something they actually gave you a house with your 20 dollar pledge for their game or whatever it was and they did all kind of weird stuff you know they gave away of you know uh, a bunch of different things like that and it just occurred to me well hey what if we gave away a cat right (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, and it would just be something to generate some some press, maybe, you know, get people interested in seeing what was going on. But the more I thought about it, um, the more the more it appealed to me, the idea of sort of um, leaning into the idea that cat adoption is is really an important thing for for animal lovers. Um, and there's a huge homeless animal problem and you know there's there's animals in shelters that need to be adopted and i i just thought if this was a way we could kind of shine shine a spotlight on that that it would be a a win-win you know it would be a a win for us to get some something unique about the campaign and would be a win for you know to to, to shine some light on that uh on animal adoption and so the way we ended up structuring it was we started the campaign with a single one of these pledge levels um and it was just one dollar more than the game itself. So you could you yeah. could get the game at a twenty dollar pledge level. We had a twenty one dollar pledge level that basically yeah. said, "Hey, pledge at this level, and if you adopt a cat within the period, you know, within some short time period after the campaign, um, we will reimburse you two hundred dollars worth of vet and adoption fees for your, you know, associated with your adoption." And we were terrified the whole time that 
this would be breaking some kind of Kickstarter <laughs> rule <laughs> because they, I mean, they have some pretty specific rules against including live animals uh, in your reward levels. Like you can't, you can't have a Kickstarter for live animals that includes live animals. And so um, we reached out to Kickstarter and asked, Hey, can you clear this for us? And we never heard mm. back and never heard back. And the launch day was approaching. We were like, we're just going to run with it I... <laughs> and see if they, <laughs> see if they take us down, you know? Um, but it ended up working out. And we, and the other thing we were doing with that was every 200 ple- normal pledges we received, we added an additional one of those, cat adoptions and we ended up um we ended up having five different families adopt cats and get reimbursement um you know a thousand dollars worth of reimbursement from the campaign and uh one of those adopters ended up adopting four cats (laughs) at the same time (laughs) and so uh we ended up hey we we placed eight cats over the course of that project in in their forever homes as they say so yeah that that was a great part of it for us and we had a website where they could give us updates over the course of the campaign so people would go and look and see as they were picking what cat to adopt and what cat they ended up with and all that was a big fun part of it too but that's that's one of the things i i don't know i think that's one of the things i kind of miss about kickstarter is the kind of the community side of things um Mm -hmm. i i think it seems to have um lost its way a little bit in terms of where it's kind of going mm. um it seems to be i don't know i think it's i think it's it's like one of these things that was sitting it was sitting pretty for ages kickstarter was sitting wonderful and it's kind of approached it the same way that maybe patreon or spotify or any of these, these other places as we provide the platform you put the content on there and then we make money off the back of it. And I think right. what's happened with Kickstarter is it's starting to realise that it, that kind of doesn't necessarily work for tabletop games and we need somebody to we need somebody to kind of hold the hands a kind of a bit. And uh, it also seems to be... <clears throat> it also seems to be doing... I don't know if, like, they wake up in the morning and it's kind of like, God, how can we make people not like us more? I know, <laughs> let's talk about blockchain. Um, oh, what, what else? Well, okay, well, I don't know. AI, shall we do AI art? And there was, I think I saw a couple of weeks ago a guy that had basically launched the campaign, which had, he pretty much kind of confessed in the kind of the, the campaign that, None of the artwork was his. It was all AI generated. And in right. fact, he had quite literally put the rule book for Catan into the... chat GPT and said, go and oh change this gosh. and change the theme to this. So he was kind of like, oh yeah, we kind of did work, but we used kind of like chat GPT to help kind of generate the kind of the rules. And I think <laughs> the last time I checked, he had about like, about, I don't even know if the campaign went ahead, but he had about two or three kind of pledges and that was it. And it was probably him... And probably two of his friends that had done the right, done the right. Kind of the well, that's pledge. reassuring at least that he had so few backers. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, you're talking about the you know the lovely artwork that's been done on Hissy Fit, and I'm like, well, that is that's basically that's art. Somebody's been paid for that art, and that's helping that person kind of go ahead and you know continue to be an artist, which is a kind of like a wonderful thing. You used um, GameFound as the pledge manager. Are you gonna? Ki- I mean, they've obviously they've obviously stepped. They've obviously from going from dipping a toe in the water. They're now kind of jumped on with both mm-hmm. feet, and they're offering a kind Absolutely. of like a full kind of um, um, crowdfunding service. So, are you? If you're doing another game, are you? Is it good to have choice now? Is it good to like be able to say, well, I can look at Backerkit or I can look at GameFound as well as looking at kind of Kickstarter? Does that give you kind of different avenues now? Oh, yeah, 100%. So I think it's fantastic that Kickstarter has some competition now. Yeah. Um, and aside from the value that's provided by the, the options, the additional choices for creators, I think just mm-hmm. that competitive pressure is going to make all of them better. And we're seeing that already. I think Kickstarter has already added features uh, in reaction to the competition that's that's coming from GameFound uh, primarily. 
Um, yeah. And yeah. so I think that's that can only be a good thing. Um, I never wanted to run my own <laughs> crowdfunding campaign. <laughs> like that was sort of a last <laughs> resort for us yeah. because yeah. I knew it was going to be so much work. I knew it was going to require skills that were not my wheelhouse, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm mm -hmm. thrilled that we did as well as we did. And again, I think Levi and I complimented each other well, um, providing different pieces of the puzzle for that. But I, I don't think either one of us is especially excited about the idea of running another one because it's just a ton of work and I have a, <laughs> I have a job. <laughs> like, exactly. I got, mean, I would love, I would love, yeah. yeah, I would love for, for game design and publishing to be able to be my full-time job, but it's, that is a tough road. And so, um, you know, I would love to be able to just focus on design and then hand my designs off to publishers who are really good at, at that and can do it at scale. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, that said, if I was going to do another Kickstarter or another crowdfunding campaign, and it's not off the table completely, I, you know, I've thought about uh, things that might lead me to do that. Um, I think that my own analysis, my own imperfect analysis of the current crowdfunding landscape would probably lead me to uh, to turn to GameFound for a yeah. big hobby game like my Magnetic Gears <laughs> game, you know, my steampunk game. If I was going to try and crowdfund that, I would almost certainly go to GameFound because it has a much bigger hobby game audience, I think. Uh, he heavy game, you know, I, th I think heavy games yeah. are going to do no, better yeah. on GameFound. Um, if well, I was going to do... Simon's do... Simo jump, sh jump yeah, ship. Exactly. Jumped onto there. Yeah, exactly. Um, if I was going to do another game of the weight of Hissy Fit, I think I would probably, mm. st if I was doing it today, I would probably still do it on Kickstarter because Kickstarter uh, still brings, as I understand it, a much bigger organic audience to oh, yeah. be exposed to your game through the Kickstarter platform itself. And we, yeah. we uh, a huge majority, I mean, I think maybe 60% of our backers um, and again, this data is a little hard to know exactly how, how much to believe it, but because it comes from Kickstarter, uh, but yeah. it, you know, if, if the data is to be believed about 60% of our backers came organically through Kickstarter. So I don't think Hissy Fit would have been nearly as successful on GameFound where it wouldn't appeal to the crowd that's there. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, as much as a heavier game. Yeah. I mean, they have opened the floodgates now to let kind of anybody on now as before it was a sure you know, it was a kind of a it was kind of by arrangement but we'll see i agree with well, you i think it's good i think it's good that kickstarter has some kind of competition i think it will hopefully get them to look at how things are being carried out and it'll allow game found to look at what how they're doing and backer kit to see how they're all mm -hmm. doing you know if there's almost like uh, somebody that it's it's about kickstarter don't seem haven't seemed to be able to police themselves so if that means that they lose companies out to other places that are maybe willing to do that, it might right. get them to kind of get kind of a bit more involved. Um, Absolutely. Which is good. One thing we haven't talked about, I mean, I'm guilty, absolutely guilty of doing that, is for people that have listened along today, do you want to give us the kind of the... the um, the 115 second elevator pitch <laughs> for Hissy Fit. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So Hissy pra Fit. You practice this, Chris. Uh, yes, yes, know. of course. Well, we've been talking. We, Yeah, we. You're, you're, it's a great point. We've talked a lot about a game that we didn't really tell anybody <laughs> what it is. So we should do that. Well, so, welcome to um, the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We call Hissy Fit a, co a cooperative card game of coordinated cat coaxing. So this is a cooperative game. Um, it's uh, about getting your cat in the carrier to take to the vet. Uh, it's a, mostly a card game. So you've got um, uh, human cards that are in your hand and cat cards that go out on the table. The cat cards represent obstacles uh, preventing the cat from moving towards the carrier. And then you have a single card uh, that goes out on the table with a adorable cat meeple um, that has to traverse a little, you know, 10, 10 or so steps to get from the start point into the carrier. Um, and so your human cards are allow you to remove cat cards 
uh, from the from the table. Um, mm-hmm. And they also allow you to move the cat on the track. Uh, they allow you to remove scratches and, and other things. Uh, the, the cat cards that come out onto the uh, into the cat row, as we call it, uh, do things like prevent the cat from being moved. Um, they give you scratches. They um, move the cat backwards on the tracker. Um, and then they also have instant effects such as adding scratches and also adding hisses to three different hissy fit cards that are face down at the start of the game. Uh, yeah. Whenever any of the hissy fit cards get three of those hisses, they flip over and something terrible happens. The cat just loses its mind and has a hissy fit. Uh, and if all three hissy fit cards flip over that's sort of the game timer so um, there are exactly enough cards with hisses in the cat deck to trigger the three hissy fits by the end of the game Um, so if the three hissy fit cards are flipped over the game's over and all the players lose and likewise if you uh, get all the scratches you know there's the 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 basic uh, difficulty level of the game has five scratches if you ever have five scratches uh, game's over and you lose um and then, of course, if you get the cat in the carrier, everybody wins together, and you get the cat to the vet. But if you if you fail, then the trip to the vet turns into a trip to the emergency room, <laughs> and the cat, the cat doesn't go to the vet that day. <laughs> <That's all> <laughs> There's like extra kind of things, like uh, you get scratched by the cat and then abs- a- accidentally fall into a vat of lemon juice, um, and that seems that seems that's quite, in the expansion. That seems quite cruel. <laughs> Um, you know that's not that's not a good one. Uh, no. no. Um, is I'm making notes. People, making notes for the next set of no, cards. No, don't because no, no, it's not because we've already been there and I'm just making an absolute mess of everything. Um, in terms of people getting hold of a copy of the games, I guess when you did the print run, you had enough. You did a print run which gave you enough to have some in kind of like to the side for further kind of distribution so are people able to pick up a kind of a copy now that the game is kind of out in the wild as they would say or out in the cat box as they would say (laughs) yes 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 you you certainly can so yeah we we ended up with about a thousand backers uh on Mm. our original campaign uh we Mm. did a three thousand unit print run which was a little bigger than we had originally anticipated, yeah. uh, but no. we were excited to be able to do that. So um, you can get the game today at hissyfitgame.com. Uh, goes to our landing page, and you can click there to go to... Right now, today, the only option we have is to go to the GameFound uh, Late Pledge yeah. Uh, yeah. platform, but you can you can still Late Pledge today, and we're, we're processing orders sort of on a weekly basis, so you'll get it quickly. Uh, if you order there and oh, we're right. okay. on the, okay. yeah, so you don't have to wait. Yeah, you're not going to be waiting a long time if you place an order for it today um, uh, on GameFound. And because it's fully delivered, the all the Kickstarter backers who've completed their pledge manager have, have their games now. Um, the, uh, uh, so that's the that's the option today. We're in the process of setting up a, an e-commerce site, so we're going to have a, a you know an online store, but it'll be available at that same link. So it'll we'll we'll just change where the where the button goes on our landing page, uh, and then we've also uh, started uh, working with distributors to get these into game stores. So mm-hmm. hopefully mm-hmm. you'll be able to find this at your friendly local game store soon, if if it's not there already, or unfriendly if they don't like cats. I guess. <laughs> or yes, your friendly, your, your local game store of whatever <laughs> demeanor <laughs> you happen to have. Whatever, whatever emotional dissonance they're involved in today. <laughs> exactly. <basically. laughs> um, but if people have listened along and they want to keep an eye on what you're up to, where can they find you on the internet webs, Mr. Stone? Where do you exist? Yes. So I have a website, which is stoneagedistractions.com. That's the name of my publishing company and my mm-hmm. sort of design after the brand for my design efforts. Currently, that website has just been hijacked by the Hissy Fit landing page. <laughs> so if oh. you go to Stone Age Distractions today, it'll Damn. just redirect you to to learn about Hissy Fit. But as, as we move into other projects, that'll be a place to mm. see what else is coming. Um, and then I'm most active uh, online on Facebook. 
so you can search for me there. I'm also a moderator, as I mentioned before, of the uh, BGDL, the Board Game Design Lab uh, oh, Facebook right, okay. group, and that's sort of yeah. that's sort of my biggest haunt in the design in the game design world. Um, and any designers out there who who aren't a member of that group, I highly recommend it. Good good place on yeah, the Gabe, on the interwebs. Gabe, Gabe was on the show a long long. A long, long... I was almost going to do a Ben Kenobi kind of voice. <laughs> oh, a long time ago, before you were born. Um, That's a name I haven't heard in a very long time. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, and we had a, um, maybe we had a fasc- fascinating discussion at, at the time. Um, and the, yes, Board Game Design Lab is a good place if you are either a fully uh, fully experienced designer or if you're taking your kind of your first steps into it. We will, of course, make sure that we put all of the links in the show notes so that we've got notes to show. If you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, there's a couple of places you can go. If you want to check out the other podcasts that we've done, you can find it through places like Spotify. If you search for We Are Not Wizards, you'll find it there. Or you can go to the main podcast website, which is wearenotwizards.com. If you want to read words that we have written down once we play games and we think, hmm, what do we think of that game? Then you can go to we'renotwizards.co.uk and you'll see a breadth of different reviews, eh, in, <laughs> including one that we have done recently about uh, Exploding Kittens, which is their, um, uh, which is their, uh, it's their variation of Love Letter hmm. they've got out there, which is Power Hungry Pets which I'm not going to talk about because it's another cat-based game. And I'm like, <laughs> up to here, the cat-based games at the moment. But yeah, if you want to go, we're not wizards.co.uk. You'll find previous web podcast episodes as well as written reviews, previews, and general game news as well. If you like what you've listened to tonight, please go to your podcast catcher of choice and drop us a rating or review. And it'd be wonderful if you told other people of our existence. Um... But there's only a couple more things to do. First of all, thank you very, very much for guesting, Chris. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, you. Richard. Great to Hi. speak with you. Thank you for having me. Um, there's only a couple of things left to do. The first thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Chris? Well, as we heard about an hour ago, we are the best, but not wizards. <laughs> and <laughs> we've also got to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from... Rather wonderful, rather fantastic, very calm, not having a hissy fit at all. Mr. Chris Stone, say goodbye, Chris. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye for me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes, and um, check out hissy fits. You know, if you get the box and you stroke it very gently, it does make a purring sound, apparently. (laughs) Well, at least the second edition does. (laughs) <laughs> and they've also got the holes in the bottom of the box for the foot, which we guarantees is going to be in the next the next printing, which I've now committed. So there you go. But 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 until the next until the next time. Goodbye. A wizard is never late. Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to.